Hi, hello, happy new year. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. I am Liv and oh, how I have missed you guys. So a couple things right at the top here. I know I told you all I was going to re-release old episodes in anticipation of the Aeneid coming up and well, I didn't. That's because I managed to basically break my computer and couldn't get it fixed until the end of December because the holidays and the places, they're just not open. Anyway, that sucked. Um, It was at least good timing and that I wasn't meant to release an episode, but it sucked. And if you're hearing it, then it's officially fixed, which is pretty wonderful. I also have a big announcement. I don't remember if I've said this already. I don't think I have. I'm appearing at the Vancouver Fan Expo. It's pretty exciting. I mean, it's basically Comic-Con, but Vancouver. Um, It's in February, February 15th to the 17th. That's right. Little old me has been asked to be at the Fan Expo. I'll have a table where I'll be giving away free stickers, selling merch, and we can even just hang out and chat mythology. I'll be appearing on a couple of podcast panels and I'll have my own live show. Oh my gosh, there's so many things. Um, so please, if you're anywhere in the vicinity of Vancouver, the lower mainland, maybe northern Washington, wherever, come out and show your support. And also please buy my merch because this is the first time I've had to actually buy it up front and it's expensive. <laughs> um, so again, Vancouver Fan Expo it's big. It's from February 15th to the 17th. Please come out. It's probably the coolest thing I've ever done. And again, this is Vancouver, BC, like Canada, because of course it is, you guys, I'm Canadian. And also our Vancouver is like a million jillion times bigger and more famous than your Vancouver. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. Let us have this one thing. Anyway, um, I'm back today. It it hasn't been that long, but something feels crazy weird about it anyway. Um, but I'm back with our first preparatory episode for the upcoming Roman epic, The Aeneid. Mini-myth. Friends, Romans, countrymen. Rome, Janus, and Virgil's Aeneid. Welcome to the end of the world, or so the Romans thought. (laughs) That, my friends, is a quote from the course I took on Roman literature during my undergrad. I still remember it because, well, it was a really insane way to start a course. Like, I'm talking this is the first thing our prof said to us, just like that. Also, our prof looked like a slightly more awkward Napoleon Dynamite. I think he was referring to the end of the Roman Republic because the writings we focused on were from the Roman Empire and the transition between the two. But honestly, all I remember is that insane quote and very notable visual of the professor saying it. I think maybe he had a slide of like a planet exploding behind him, something like that. It was great. Anyway, that's the course where I was supposed to read the Aeneid. And I did read some, but I read from a different translation than the rest of the class, and it was weird, and I didn't really get much out of it. It was kind of um, stupid on my part. And here we are, almost 10 years later, and I am reading it again, but for real this time. So here's the main thing about the Aeneid that's different from the epics we've covered before. It's Roman. And sure, I've used Ovid as a source tons of times before, but this is different. The story of the Aeneid is the story of Rome itself, its founding and its history in the minds of the Romans. It was written during the reign of Augustus, and that fact is vital to understanding it. And so in this first episode of the new year, it is all about Rome. Who doesn't love Rome? They were fucked up, but like in a fun way. And when better to begin our Roman epic than in January, which is also Roman, named for the Roman god Janus. And how are you going to connect Janus and January to Virgil, Liv? Not particularly smoothly, I can tell you that, but I wanted to cover them both in this episode. So here we have it. Janus is the god of transitions, of doorways. In Ovid's work, The Fasti, where he writes of January, the year's first month, he says that Janus is the, quote, origin of the quietly gliding year. 
Janus, like the Aeneid, is exclusively Roman. One thing that will become very clear as we cover this epic is that most of Roman gods had their origins in Greek. The Romans took them as their own, adapted their personalities and names, and didn't see them quite in the same way that the Greeks did. To the Romans, they were a bit less real, not these towering gods in the sky that would come down and fuck and fuck with mortals. They were more conceptual than the gods of the Greeks, but a bit closer to what we think of as modern religions. But for the most part, the gods themselves were developed from Greek counterparts. Not Janus, though. The two-faced god, he was purely Roman. Yes, Janus is quite literally two-faced. He's depicted as having a face on either side of his head. This is his place as the god of transitions and beginnings, of duality and of time. January is named for him for this reason. It is a transition, the beginning of a new year, a time to start anew. Janus was incredibly important to Rome, both as a concept and deity, possibly one of the most important gods set alongside Jupiter, the Romans' equivalent of Zeus. In terms of power and importance, they were similarly matched, surprisingly. It's for this reason, and for the obvious reason that I said a minute ago, that the calendar begins with January. The Romans added January to their calendar pretty early on. It seems undecided when. I found two very different answers. But it was added long before our friends Ovid and Virgil were writing. Seamless transition, Liv. There they are. These two men lived around the same time in the first century BC, though Virgil was a couple decades older than my boy Ovid. They wrote during the Augustan period, one of Rome's most important time periods. This is when Augustus took control and Rome flourished. They wrote of the greatness of Rome and its mythological histories, though Ovid was actually eventually exiled by the Emperor Augustus. But as much as I'd like it to be, this is not about Ovid. It is about Virgil and his Aeneid. When Augustus, or Octavian as he was known of before, took control of Rome in a civil war after the death of Julius Caesar, he brought with him a resurgence of the heroic, if mythological, history of Rome. He launched a propaganda campaign along with a truly peaceful period for a time. The Pax Augusta, or the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, this is Augustus's biggest accomplishment. And with that peace, he tapped into the Romans' connection to their heroic past, their heroic founding as a civilization. Virgil, a prominent poet of the time, he helped. He gave the Romans an epic work to associate with this epic founding. This origin is in one of the most famous and monumental wars of the region, real or not. Virgil gave the Romans an epic to connect their history to that of Troy and Aeneas's journey, his odyssey, you could call it, from Troy to his founding of Rome. As David Studdard says in his book on Roman mythology, quote, one of the key foundations of Augustan peace was Roman mythology. Many fancy, educated, aristocratic, often philosopher Romans didn't much care for the way the Greeks handled their deities. Cicero believed that one's relationship to religion should be based in sacrifices and other rites, looking out for divine signs and of prophecy. The way the Greeks handled it, with their gods behaving like love-struck teenagers and horrible rapists, wasn't particularly good for public morality. And I mean... Are they wrong? At the same time, though, everyday Romans lived for Greek mythology. They even dressed up as gods at parties. This is all according to the Stoddard book listed in my sources. But he also says that the Romans would use Greek myths in their amphitheater games, where people would act out those characters and basically kill each other off, like in the myths. Very Roman. Gladiator style, but mythological. And worse. He's got an Icarus anecdote in this book that's it's pretty dark. Like, yeah, someone 
had wings strapped to them and they were dropped from a very high height and they died. And that was just a thing the Romans watched happen. (laughs) The Romans were fucked up, you guys, but they were also fun and awful and dark. They really liked killing people for sport. There's so much more to the Roman relationship to mythology and to their deities, but I do not have nearly enough sources on the subject. And my purpose here is really to just emphasize the way the Romans felt about mythology was very different from the way the Greeks felt about mythology. Augustus, too, is vital to understanding the Aeneid. His resurgence of the heroic history of the Romans is the driving force behind the very existence of Virgil's Aeneid. It's exactly this. The Aeneid is a piece of propaganda to remind the Romans where they came from and just how incredibly impressive they were. The Romans especially during the reign of Augustus, believed that they were the absolute best civilization in the world, that they could do no wrong. They believed that their military was almighty and not to be questioned, that it deserved more funding than anything else, even more than feeding and housing their citizens. Augustus was making Rome great. Okay, maybe I'm thinking of another country here. I don't think I fully understood the context of covering Virgil's Aeneid at this point in history until I began writing this story today, January 4th, 2020. Okay, but for real, this is all true of Rome, if not so explicitly. There's no way for me to avoid the connection right now. Virgil's Aeneid isn't just about the founding of Rome, or ironically, given the statement I just made, the travels of a refugee of the Trojan War. It's about the Roman belief in the inevitability of their power and control over the Mediterranean world. Their belief that they deserved the power that they had, that they inherently earned it because they were better than others. Roman exceptionalism, you could call it. I told myself I wanted to bring back listeners in 2020 and I'm off to a great start. But enough about that. In order to prepare you for Virgil's Aeneid, I need to also remind you about a man named, quite conveniently, Aeneas. You might remember Aeneas from the Trojan War, the Iliad, because he was a prince of Troy, and I mentioned him many, many times, making frequent, incredibly obvious references to the fact that he would go on to found Rome, because I am not one for subtleties, as evidenced in the things I've already said in this episode. (laughs) In the Iliad, Aeneas is a prince, a human man, if one particularly skilled in battle. But in Virgil's Aeneid, you'll see him, for lack of a better word, evolve. Edith Hamilton attributes this to what I've already gone over. Virgil's patriotism to the Rome that Augustus had brought about after the death of Julius Caesar. The epic was written in response to that. Also, I just want to clear something up. I am not saying that a certain president is anything like Augustus, but propaganda is propaganda. Anyway, Virgil makes Aeneas into something far more impressive than the character that he was in Homer's Iliad. Because the man that founded Rome, he wasn't any old Trojan who wandered off. To Virgil and to the Romans, he was special. He was a hero. He had to be so much more than the Aeneas we saw in the Iliad. Who is Aeneas, though? Well, if you remember your Iliad, he's said to be the son of Aphrodite, and she favors him quite heavily in the Iliad. But Aphrodite will, of course, in the series be referred to by her Latin name, Venus. And the same goes for all the gods, so a quick refresher. Zeus's Latin name is Jupiter, or sometimes Jove, but I prefer Jupiter. Hera's Latin name is Juno. Athena's Latin name is Minerva, like McGonagall. Artemis's Latin name is Diana. Demeter's Latin name is Ceres. Aphrodite's Latin name, like I said, is Venus. Ares's Latin name is Mars. Apollo's, well, Apollo's is Apollo. It's weird. Hermes's Latin name is Mercury. Poseidon's Latin name is Neptune. Hades' Latin name is Pluto, and Kronos' Latin name is Saturn. 
Also, if you're counting off the planets on your fingers, like I always have to do, and you're all like, wait, Liv, you're forgetting one, then just remember back to when I told you how to pronounce the name of Kronos's father way, way back in the day. It's Uranus, not Uranus, you guys. So yeah, I don't have the time to look into the why, but Uranus is the one planet whose name is both a Greek and a Roman god. It's kind of funny, just like Uranus is when you're a kid. (laughs) As more Latin names come up in the Aeneid, I will tell you who they are, remind you of their Greek equivalents. Though a notable mortal that will, of course, come up is my man, man, Odysseus. His Latin name is Ulysses. Well, friends, I think that's enough information for now. (laughs) Get yourselves comfy in the world of Rome. Oh, how I fucking love Rome. It's similar to how much I fucking love Greece, but not quite as much. You gotta have your favorites, you know? Oh, thank you all for listening to this, the first episode of 2020. How the fuck is it 2020? As we dive into the Aeneid, I do want to announce that I think I've come up with a means of doing some bonus Patreon content for my wonderful and steadfast patrons. You see, my deeply beloved Ovid also wrote of Aeneas's story because Augustus wanted all the propaganda he could get. So provided it works as well as I hope it does and I plan it does, I will provide the patrons with episodes of Ovid's version of the Aeneid as we go. Hopefully. I mean, if they're exactly the same story, that would be weird. And honestly, I haven't had two minutes to read through them to see if they're the same. Anyway, that's the plan. So fingers crossed. Otherwise, I'll come up with something else wonderful and nice and special for you wonderful, generous people who seriously make my life livable when it comes to the podcast. And especially right now, I would be eternally grateful to everyone who gives me a five-star rating and review on iTunes. And please subscribe wherever you listen. It honestly makes a huge difference for me. It's a little thing you can do that makes a big impact. Thank you all. I truly love you. I'm so grateful to have such wonderful, amazing listeners. To all of you in Vancouver, in the Lower Mainland, Northern Washington, Western Alberta, I don't know, wherever, if you come to the Vancouver Fan Expo, I will owe you my whole heart. And please also buy merch, because I'm about to drop like $1,500 that I don't have on preparing for this event. Investing in yourself is weird. (laughs) I'm losing my mind a little bit tonight. It's the first episode after... A month of very deep exhaustion. You're all the best. I love you so much. I'm Liv and I couldn't possibly love this shit more.